Meritocracy is defined as a system in which the talented are chosen and moved ahead on the basis of their achievement. The term meritocracy was originally coined in the 1958 satirical essay by the sociologist Michael Young. You heard that right. Satire. The essay was a dystopian tale set in 2033, where a historian, now living in a so-called meritocracy, looked back in time to review how they had got there. Young's historian proved also to be a wise futurist when he recognized the limits of meritocracy. His forecast included a future full of simplistic judgment, saying, for example, the eminent know that success is a just reward for their own capacity, their own efforts, and in which the lower orders know that they have failed every chance that they were given. He also envisioned a day where merit-based systems would ironically lead to the hoarding of advantages amongst those who had worked their way to the top, writing that nearly all parents are going to try to gain unfair advantages for their offspring. We conflate systems with ideals. Is the difference between this is how things work and this is how things should work? Is the ideal of meritocracy that we should all constantly be striving to live by? Ultimately, this means ensuring that everyone plays by the same set of rules, where the playing field is created level for all. But it must first start by being honest enough to admit when we've gained favor through other means and recognizing when certain practices are not as much about merit as we would like to think that they are. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today I'm talking with Richard Reeves, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, whose research focuses on the middle class, inequality, and social mobility. His latest book is Dream Hoarders, how the American upper middle class is leaving everyone else in the dust, why that is a problem, and what to do about it. Our conversation really challenges us all to reconsider our own American dream story, and more importantly, what we're doing to help or hinder the dreams of others. Have a listen. I hope you enjoy. So, Richard, I, I wanted to start with maybe a, a little-known fact about you, which, which is I read that you were born on the 4th of July. And so as someone who's a, a, a Brit who studies mobility and class issues and stuff like that, I'm wondering how, not just when you were born, but also your own experience growing up in one country and working with another informs your work. Yes, it is interesting that I happen to be born on that. Maybe, like, if you believe in predestination, sort of Calvinist idea, then maybe it was just always there, inscribed on me. Like, a, I was going to become American, which I, I did. I became a U.S. citizen in 2016, just in time to vote, uh, as, as it happens. So I managed to vote in both the 2016 presidential election and the Brexit referendum in the U.K. So make of that what you will. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's a nice little irony. And I'm kind of, I am a US citizen and, uh, and have moved here permanently. Uh, I think the different experience of how opportunity and class are talked about and thought about in the UK and the US has definitely been important to my work. In some ways, much of my work in the UK in public policy, uh, government journalism was driven by this sense of anger and frustration at the barriers that are put in front of people, right? I think I came by that naturally from my parents, especially my my father. Um, but this kind of notion of upward mobility and opportunity was pretty much there for me from the beginning. Um, and then doing a compare and contrast when I moved to the US. I actually was a US correspondent for the Guardian newspaper for a, a brief while. So I'd kind of been engaged with US society a little bit. But, you know, the, the brute finding that the US class system operates more ruthlessly and more efficiently than the British class system has really been a kind of profound realization for me and kind of my my and has driven a lot of my work in the in the US uh, since moving over here to the average person they probably wouldn't even accept that presumption right they there's a presumption that there's mobility here and there's a presumption there's a rigidity of class in in, in the UK obviously some of your work challenges that right mm -hmm. and i remember or I, I came across this sort of quote which is even interesting your response in hearing it because it sounds harsh and it's probably harsher than it intended which is so imagine my horror at discovering the united states is more calcified by class in britain especially towards the top the big difference is that most of the people of the highest rung in america are in denial about their privilege the american myth of meritocracy allows them to attribute their position to their brilliance and diligence rather than to luck or a rigged system. 
at least posh people in England have the decency to feel guilty. Right. No, I I, I think I'm meant to be that harsh, Rob. So <laughs> I'll stand by it. <laughs> because, I mean, the thing is, I spent much of my life like loathing the British class system in various ways, one in which it stood in, in the way of people, but also just the, the sapping class consciousness of British culture, just this constant minute calibrations as to which class you're in based on how you hold your fork and how you talk and what music you listen to and what kind of gene whatever just it's exhausting and annoying but and and of course by comparison what a you know what a breath of fresh air the u.s is you know where presidents wear baseball caps and everyone wears the same jeans and you know we're all basically the same and isn't that great Uh, and so i've long been attracted to that ideal and so but what i've came to realize is that that apparent classlessness is just a really effective camouflage for a ruthlessly effective class reproduction machine in the US. And and why it's so damaging is precisely because of this sense of of, of the kind of invisible, it's like an an invisibility cloak for American inequality. Uh, Because, well, I got here through hard work, you know, it's a meritocracy and so on. So first of all, it's shocking to people when you just present data showing that the US is less upwardly mobile than the UK. They don't get that. And so you have to fight. They say, well, I know. And and you have this constant thing where, you know, the N of one problem. Well, I came from poor background. Okay, that's one. That's an N of one. Find something right. Whereas, of course, you're working big data sets. So partly it's just about informing it. But I do think that the real problem is that, and this is why posh people have the decency to feel guilty point, is that I do think, and I served in the coalition government with incredibly posh people I was working alongside, you know, one of the poshest cabinets in recent British history with, you know, David Cameron and, and Clegg and Osborne and so on, and, and, and all the old Etonians, and we've still got an old Etonian, right, as prime minister, so very, very posh. But what was interesting about that was that they did know, they did know that. They did know that they'd been to a private school and come from privilege and so on. So they were at, were at least aware of it. And that kind of created the space, that awareness created space. Whereas in the US, of course, all the people who've been incredibly successful, like, oh, no, 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 it's just because of my own brilliance. And that invisibility cloak that comes from the myth of classlessness and meritocracy has been a real challenge, I think, to making progress on these issues in the US. It's interesting you use the invisibility cloak. So my family has just gone through sort of all the Harry Potter books and movies. And my wife and I are now watching The Crown. And there is this sort of base level attractiveness to the UK and class. There's an admiration for it. And I wonder if similarly in the UK, they look at America and they admire what they think is possible here. Like, a, you know, the grass is greener across the, the pond kind of a thing going on. And I wonder if you give any sort of thoughts about American attitudes towards class as reflected in other cultures versus their own. Well, it is fascinating how things like Downton Abbey and The Crown and so on are just so popular in the US. And and American friends will very often say to me, are you, you know, are you excited about the new baby? And I'll be like, what are you talking about? And then they'll turn out about <laughs> Harry and Meghan or someone having some, I mean, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't care less, you know, which of the royals are, are reproducing when. But the fascination of the US for it, of course, is partly because of this sort of missing limb syndrome that the US has around authority and class and so on, right? There is this sort of phantom limb thing. But I, and I think it's partly about authority. I think this kind of sense of where does authority come from and tradition and all those things, right? So because America is such a new country, I think it's constantly reaching for antecedents and kind of historical ballast in a way that's just you know less true of other countries. So I think it's partly that sort of the the historical nature of it. But the thing that's missed there is that the, so yes, we have a hereditary monarchy, and yes, actually we still have some people in our upper house who are hereditary. You know, Tony Blair didn't quite manage to get rid of all the hereditary peers. Uh, although tried, and then we tried again when we were in coalition, again, failed. But that's a very thin veneer, and it's almost ornamental now. There's this line from Badger of kind of the ornamental monarchy and the ornamental aristocracy. And so essentially those very, very top layer of the aristocracy is is pretty much ornamental now in terms of political power. But right below that, there's quite a lot of churn. And so what's missing, I think, is this sense of like if you broaden your lens, not just to look at the top 0.001%, who are in the British aristocracy, and instead just look at the top 20% or 10%, right? Who are the doctors? Who are the lawyers? Who are the politicians? Who are the who are the journalists? Who are the pr- professors, et cetera? And you just take that upper middle class approach. That's when you find that the US really does do a kind of much better job of reproducing its privilege, right? And better, I'm using better in a 
pejorative sense in this sense. And so I think that's just missing. You know, if you're if you're dazzled by the monarchy stuff and the House of Lords stuff and the old stuff, then you you miss the fact that below that pretty thin crust, we're a bit more mobile in the UK. I'm not saying the UK is some sort of utopia. Don't get me wrong, but just a little bit more mobile than the US is. And so I think that the kind of Burkean admiration for an aristocracy and history and so on is kind of fine. But but once again, it can play into this myth, which is that we're not like that, right? Mm. <laughs> we're not like that. And it's true. And it, constitutionally, that's true. You know, the US is not like that. But in some ways, the US has bigger problems than a hereditary monarchy because it has a more closed society in terms of ch- risks of upward mobility and a more segregated society. To me, it's fascinating to hear you speak about it in a way I wonder if there's this just mutual attraction to the top, Hmm. you know, to being on the top, whether you were born there or you climbed your way there or you actually were helped there, but you didn't realize it. This sort of fixation on, on, on just how does someone get up there and that's the life I want versus here's the kind of life that would just make me happy. Yeah, I think that's really, so the, the obsession with the top is really interesting, isn't it? The kind of constantly craning our necks to look up. And in the UK, that's sort of being obsessed with, say, the royals or whatever, and to some extent, celebrities. And then in the same in the US with the super rich, you know, the obsession with how many billions Jeff Bezos is worth on a day-to-day basis or, you know, whatever. It's just, and so I guess the, the interesting question is to what extent that's I won't use the phrase hardwired because I think that's the, Jonathan Haidt has taught me that that's a bad phrase. <laughs> um, but the extent to which we are, I'm thinking about Michael Young's work and, and Alan de Botton's work on status, right? And the fact that we are status aware creatures, right? I think that to some extent, being aware of where you are in a kind of pecking order comes with the territory of being being human. But as we develop as humans, the question then becomes, how far can you alleviate that sense? How much does it matter, right? And and I think, I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but I've, I've wrestled a bit with this question of like, given that we are status conscious, how do we stop that status consciousness turning into a kind of, you know, zero sum game, mm. uh, an obsession with success, however that's defined in our particular society. And the conclusion I've come to is we should think about success pluralism. We should basically think about the fact that you can have lots of different kinds of status. Not to say status doesn't matter at all, but it but it should be to have more plurality, right? Rather than just the worst kind of society is one where there's a kind of monoculture of success. So it's just money, or it's just physical strength, or it's just academic learning, or it's just whatever, political power or whatever. What you really want is a kind of real plural culture and say, okay, maybe you're, lo- you're low on that rung and that rung and that rung, but you're pretty high on that rung, right? And give you a, a very, very anecdotal example. When I was in the UK and I was pretty senior in the UK government, writing books and stuff on Thursday evenings and very often at the weekends, I was at the bottom of the pecking order of the local scout troop. And the guy who ran the local scout troop, who was the chief, you know, the chief leader, was a former factory worker who'd been in the same factory job his whole life and was, you know, at the bottom of an occupational ladder, at the bottom of an income ladder and so on. But he was right at the top of the ladder when mm. I met my you know, he was my boss. And and then you can think of other examples like a parent or a community leader or kind of so on. So I think what we want is a multiplicity of different kind of statuses and to try and accord more weight. To the ones that are non-dominant, right? And and then yeah. in the UK, one of the, and a, a, a tiny attempt to do this was the the rise of something called people's honours. I don't know if you know about this. Mm-mm. There's no reason why you should or anyone listening to this should know about it unless <laughs> we're from the UK. But so the UK has all these honours systems, right? And they're kind of OBE masters of the British Empire and all this stuff, right? And every year, people get given it for services to the public good. But now doing people's honours, where you can nominate people, and it could be like the the person that helps kids cross the road, the traffic. You know the traffic person. Traffic. We call them. We call them lollipop ladies in the in the UK because they hold the things they hold look like lollipops, but, mm-hmm. but you know, and they were typically women. So, um, but that person, the the road crossing agent or whatever they're called now, they could they they were getting them, or the local scout leader, or the whatever. And it was small, and I actually thought it's a small step towards rethinking. Think about that word, the honors system. That's what mm. it's called. Who do we honor in our society? And it was a small step towards saying, actually, we're going to honor all kinds of different people for different kinds of statuses, including what they are in the community. And I, and I was really taken by that as a very small step in the right direction. The problem with the U.S. is maybe too much emphasis on how you're doing economically and occupationally, mm. I'd say a bit too narrow in terms of the definition of success. And that's a disaster, a unitary structure of merit and honor is very bad for human flourishing. I uh, was at a conference years ago and someone used the questions we ask our children when they're very young as an example of this. 
So this sort of tendency to ask our children, what do they want to be when they grow up? Some sort of title or occupation, normally something that would be well-to-do, right? Versus how do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be kind? Do you want to be loving? Do you want to be a good friend? Do you want to be this, right? And so even those small cues when our children are very young begin to sort of tell the story in a way that will lead them to value something when they're older, when maybe that's not what we want them valuing at all. Yeah, what do you want to be rather than, yeah, who or how is is really interesting. And I've thought about this with regards to my own own children. I have three sons, all all adults now. And someone asked me a a similar question, which is like one word to describe what you most want uh, to see in your children, how you want them to be in the world rather than, and it was kind. There's survey data that I think that, that says that is the universal answer that the parents will give. They want their child to be kind. You know, kindness sometimes requires a certain level of self-awareness. I know that conversations here in the U.S. that even use the word privilege, that sometimes people can bristle at it. You know, that the presumption that one is privileged by the nature of their race or gender or other factors that are beyond their control. Or there's obviously privilege that comes with being born into a certain family where you have more assets or access to things than others. And so I know that conversation is really challenging, but it seems like you went one, one step further with it when you introduced the idea of hoarding. You know, privilege is something that is maybe we just presume we have and we should know about versus hoarding, which is a more deliberate attempt to keep something from someone else. And I'm wondering how and why you landed on that, you know, in your book, Dream Hoarders, as a means by which you wanted to draw attention to this sort of larger issue that maybe is at the root of some of the things we're talking about. Well, it's it's a, a really great question, first of all, and very timely, I think. And for me, it was an attempt to draw attention to what we do rather than who we are. And I think that the language around privilege as a result of belonging to a particular demographic category only takes you so far and actually can in some ways become a bit of a bit of a hindrance and sometimes become a bit performative. And so, for example, you take, you know, you take white privilege. You know, is it true that particularly in the US that there's that there are advantages that go with being white? Yes, I would actually say for being more accurate about it, that there, there are disadvantages of being black. Uh, is a more accurate way to describe the kind of situation, the anti-blackness of U.S. society. That specific problem with racism is somewhat different, but but it's almost like so. Then, how, what do you do about that? And the, double, the trouble is that what you do about it can become sort of more about performance. It can become about the right signs in your yard, or stickers on your car, or phrases in uh, a meeting, or attendance at certain you know uh, protests and so on. All of which are valuable. Don't get me wrong, but not necessarily changing the way you're using your power in the world in ways that will actually alter the social ecosystem around you. What are you doing, right? And so to be really blunt about it, and I've written this, is that, you know, in my liberal neighborhood, you'll get hate has no home here signs next to signs protesting local development of affordable housing. You're always disguised as, you know, whatever, environmental or parking or something. But but it's, it's your nimbyism, and exclusionary zoning <laughs> supported by liberals at the same time as they've got the right kind of attitudes. And that, so that's a kind of performative liberalism that really struggles with me. So privilege is somebody say, I'm, I'm aware of my, I'm checking my privilege. Great. Now, I'm, I'm less interested in whether you're checking your privilege than whether or not you're supporting the school integration policies, whether you're turning up at the housing board meeting to see if there'll be more housing, whether you're punishing politicians who are just giving handouts through tax subsidies to people like you, et cetera. And so it's more, I'm more interested in the action, I guess, than in the mindset. And I think the danger of the current debate about inequality is about becoming having the right mindset and that people can tick that box way too easily um, for my money. So this idea of hoarding, hoarding is something that you do rather than something that you are. So I use examples of, I've mentioned some already, exclusionary zoning, giving internships to your kids or your kids' friends, uh, using uh, using legacy preferences to get into Ivy Leagues or pulling strings, uh, et, et cetera. And, and so you know, in things like housing policy and education policy and college admissions and so on, that's where the rubber really hits the road. And there I'm much more interested in what people do or don't do 
than in what they say or don't say. I'm going to guess that you'll be able to share in a moment some stories of having conversations about this, like with even your own friends and how that goes over. And as I noted earlier, these aren't easy conversations to have, to suggest that someone who maybe is, you know, kind in some ways and has a a good spirit, a good friend, a good community member is still doing things where they are depriving things of depriving others of opportunity because they're pushing more chips you know, into the center for their own sort of advancement or that of their children. And some people might hear this podcast and, you know, I'm sure that you maybe you get this sometimes, but even someone, oh, there's someone with an English accent telling me, you know, how I should sort of be, you know, thinking about. But in fairness to you, I know that in listening to other things you've talked about or read, that you include yourself in this. Mm -hmm. Like this is not sort of you pointing the finger at someone else and saying you're doing this. And I'm wondering if there was a point in your own experience where there was some epiphanies where you're like, wait, there needs to be more that I'm doing in my own work or my own life to sort of challenge some of my own behaviors or those of people who are very close to me, even though they may be really challenging conversations. Sure. I'd say there's probably been, been a couple, but, and yes, these make for difficult conversations. What's at stake here, I think, is the answer to the following question is, are we willing to make real sacri- any real sacrifices in terms of our own position economically, socially, or much more difficult of our children's in pursuit of a fairer society? Are there some things where a small sacrifice will be required? Uh, on the part of those who have much. And I think part of the danger with the the way this is talked about, particularly in the US, is that it's always win-win. And it has to be, like, the appeal very often is we have to appeal to people's enlightened self-interest. Isn't it interesting the prefix? We have to say enlightened self-interest as opposed to just self-interest. But adding the prefix doesn't change the fact you're still appealing to their self-interest. <laughs> <laughs> still, you're still saying this is a, so the equivalent of that is like we should help poor people, otherwise they're going to come and kill us all, or the economy is going to do badly and so they won't pay. Or oh, we should worry about kids' education, even if they're not your kids, because they're going to pay your pension and all that stuff. And it's just pablum, honestly. It's become the point where it's just because you don't want to say to people, you know what, you're going to have to give something up. Right. Right. Uh, and just like that's such an unsayable thing. And that comes back a bit where we started, which is that this idea of kind of this idea that I used to hate of kind of the sense of paternalism of the kind of nobility that you get in the in, in the UK. There's at least a sense that they realize they might have to give something up, right? Maybe they didn't give up enough, but there's a sense of like, yeah, I should probably give up something. Um, whereas the American meritocratic elite have convinced themselves that they can believe in equity, but, but also not in self-sacrifice. Um, and so I think that's the underlying problem here. And so, yes, it's difficult, um, but I do include myself. And it, there was a real, I mean, actually opened my book with this when Barack Obama tried to take our 529 college savings accounts away, which is this tax advantage way that, you know, depending on the demographic of your listeners, either none of them will know about or most of them will know about. I always ask in a room when I talk about this, hands up who knows what a 529 uh, college savings account is. And you can tell what kind of room you're in by how many hands go up. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's absurd. It was a Bush era tax cut. Uh, Clinton vetoed it, but uh, it happens. It's a straight handout to the upper middle class to help them pay for their kids' college. They don't need it. It doesn't affect college savings. It's, compl- it's a horrible tax policy. And Barack Obama said, we'll do something better with the money. And wow, the world blew up. And it was the liberal world that blew up. And it was actually Nancy Pelosi and Chris Van Hollen, then my uh, congressman, now Maryland senator, who killed it. Um, because their their emails just filling up, and oh, I realized talking to my neighbors and to other people was that there were a lot of people in extremely affluent circumstances who genuinely believed they needed this tax break and deserved this tax break, you know. Uh, and it was just this moment of like, I, I was like, "Are you kidding me? I thought you were the same person that was all lefty on all these." I, I like, really? And it, it was a moment for me where I just realized that. These people have convinced themselves that they really do deserve and need this absurdly regressive tax break. And that kind of led me into other questions and and other thoughts. And you're right, it gets very personal. I'm willing to be personally held to account for this and, and be asked, well, what do you do? And are you doing enough? And the answer is something. And no, it's not enough. But... I'll give you an example, right? My my eldest son asked me for help getting him an internship at a publishing company. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not helping you. Bad father, good egalitarian, 
both? Don't know. But it was very clear to me. It's like, actually, no, because I probably could help stitch you up an internship. But that's that's a zero-sum thing. There's only so many internships. I get one for my son. He doesn't need it. And so actually the result of that is he didn't get an, as good an internship as he would have otherwise have gotten. Tiny sacrifice. Now, people can morally say well, that's wrong. You should do everything in your power short of what's illegal to help your children. Well, I don't think that that's right. I don't think that's how norms change. So um, that's an example of it. And I'll give you one other example, which is I realized I'm doing all this work on the fact that you know higher education is a problem and I'm a adjunct visiting professor at Georgetown. I don't know. Why am I doing that? <laughs> and so now I've helped Brookings to set up a joint lecture series with UDC, which is our local HBCU, and, and actually serves a very much more diverse um, population. And so Brookings scholars are now taking part in the lecture series. So I quit teaching at Georgetown and started teaching at UDC. And those are tiny things. I'm not going to try and get any moral you know, halo effect from that. But, but those have been moments where I've really just kind of gone, okay, so what are you going to do? How are you using your time and energy? And are you doing it in a way that perpetuates inequality or tackles it? And most importantly, Importantly, are you willing to make some sacrifices? And it's really tough as a parent. Of course, you want the very best for your kids. But at the same time, I want a more equal society. Do those values ever conflict? And my answer is yes, they do. And that's a really uncomfortable place to find yourself. But it's also where the rubber kind of hits the road. And I think that the kind of incredibly liberal people who think that there is no limit to what they should do on behalf of their children or their friends' children or nephews or nieces or whatever, without in any way betraying their egalitarian principles. Well, at least liberals in the UK have the decency to feel guilty when they send their kids to private K-12 schools. Here, it was incredible to me, like sitting in, in DC where I live, Sidwell Friends and Georgetown, I mean, like the most progressive people I know send their kids to incredibly expensive schools. And that's not, I have no problem with that, to be clear. What I have a problem with is that they do so without so much as a backwards glance, morally speaking. They don't even think it's a moral dilemma that there isn't some sort of tra- conflict here between their egalitarian principles and their willingness to use their money to buy better opportunity for their kids. And I don't have a good answer to that, but I do at least think we should recognize that there are moral dilemmas there. I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station WNET in New York, reporting on poverty justice and economic opportunity in america you can learn more at pbs.org backslash chasing the dream and now back to our conversation so i, I want to get to this sort of internal calculations that individuals make in a minute but before i did that i wanted to to go back to something that i think is also in the mix here which is our ability to compare ourselves to each other and find someone who's doing something worse, which makes what we're doing not seem as bad. And so I'm sure you saw the news yesterday, uh, the natural disaster that's happening down in Texas. Ted Cruz decides to go on a trip with his family to get out of the situation and is lambasted for it. Rightfully so, you know, especially as given his duties as a senator. But I wonder how much of that gives people cover to say, well, I would never do that, you know, but by the same time being okay with doing some other things that may, you know, again, be under the the same aegis as I was just doing what I thought was good for my family. Partly it's the many wrongs make a right thing, but you're right. It's also the, what's the relative moral standard? And I do, I do think that's a problem. And so just to take, I'll take one example and I just, it's not a particularly empirically weighty one, but it's a morally interesting one, which is the practice of legacy preferences in college admissions in the US. And and that's a great example where people will say to me, well, of course, yes, I'd prefer a society where we didn't do that, where we didn't have a hereditary principle at work in our college admissions systems. But given that we do, I'm going to use it. Right. So it's like this kind of situation and given mm-hmm. every and everybody else is doing it. And by the way, some of my friends know the dean. So they're calling them and my really, really rich, my Wall Street friends are making donations, right? So I'm just doing, I'm just pulling the little strings I've got. All I've got is legacy preferences and a little bit of giving, right? I love the fact that giving to colleges peaks when your oldest child turns 16. It's one of my favorite facts. Um, uh, (laughs) And and so (laughs) it really speaks a bit to what the donation is really about. The kind of everyone's doing it 
issue. I think so. It's on the one hand, it's it's real. I think we have to be honest about the fact that we do live in a particular social context. But two things: one is morally, we wouldn't say to our children if they came home and said that they cheated on an exam, a test. And their defense was everybody was cheating. The teacher left the room, and so everyone was able to cheat. Would our response be to that, oh, as long as everyone was doing it, it's okay? Or would our response be, it doesn't matter if other people were doing it, it's still wrong? I think we'd probably say the latter, actually. I don't think we would raise our children to think that as long as everyone's doing something, it's fine to do it. In fact, very often we try to teach them the opposite of that. And yet as adults, we kind of fall into that trap of saying everyone's doing it. (laughs) It's interesting what happens to our moral calculus between those kind of periods. And then the second thing is a lot of this is about norm changes, which I think might predict political changes. But then the question comes, how do social norms change? And the answer is by people starting to react against them and refusing to follow them and setting different examples. That's what happened to college legacy preferences in the UK. They weren't criminalized. They weren't outlawed. It's just that the universities realized that the normative structure of the society was changing and that they needed to change too. Um, The government didn't make Oxford and Cambridge give up legacy preferences. They had to because because culture changed, because people started to say, this is just outrageous. This is just, we can't do this, including some of the people who would benefit from it. That's the key moment. Then the norm shifts. And so you need people, Cass Sunstein's written, written very interesting about cas- norm cascades and so on, which is how do social norms change? And if we want to change some of the social norms against affordable housing, school, in- you know, interesting school integration, legacy preferences, tax codes, et cetera, then we have to start somewhere. And the one place I know I can start is with myself. Well, so the one distinction, though, that makes this a little more challenging than the example with cheating is the perception that the contrasting value to being egalitarian is often positioned as love for child or love for family. And it's interesting to me, you know, increasingly in America, there's this sort of sense that we need to do as much as we can for our children. And it's almost, in some cases, sort of belies a sense of trust that our children have been set up well enough to do okay on their own. I went and I was curious to know what the clinical definition of hoarding was, you know, for those people who have that as a mental disorder. And in some situations, you know, the sense of what you deal with a hoarder is you just go in there and you just take all their stuff and they'll stop hoarding. And that's traumatic and and also ineffective. And instead, the normal sort of effective course of treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy, so talking about it, and also building trust. And so I wonder if there was a point where, like, we don't trust our children, we don't trust ourselves enough to be able to get by with what we have or how we've got, or to, to use our own sort of skills versus this constantly sort of doubling down of, just a a little more, just that if they got the internship, then they'll be able to get their job okay. And I want to contrast that with the reality is, yes, there are things that you need to do for your children, right? That you want to do for them um, or for yourself. And one of the examples that a previous guest talked about, Shai Davide, who's a professor at Columbia, talks about is the, the notion of reading deficits, which is that we know that, you know, many kids will go into kindergarten having read significantly fewer words than other kids. And that should not be a reason for him to not read to his child, but to support programs and policies that allow other children to get more access to reading, right? So with that long windup, what's your sort of sense in terms of either when we have done enough to our children to trust them to get by on their own and to succeed, you know, where does, you know, love for child and egalitarian sort of values sort of meet in a, in a sort of a happy place for all? That's great. And actually, I love some of the work you just referenced as well. And I think that one of the reasons why people think that it's never enough, they always you know it is the extra, every, every additional 0.01% improvement in your kids' chances you can make, you should do it regardless of what it costs. And if you don't, you're a bad parent. I think that's partly because people feel like the stakes are quite high. They feel like the cost of failure is, is, is high. And so that's where inequality, I think, comes in this kind of quite vicious circle with 
hoarding, which is that if actually life looks pretty tough in the middle class, you don't want your kids to fall, right? Mm. If the idea of dropping a few quintiles on the income distribution or education distribution, whatever, looks horrifying, then your incentives to do everything in your power to avoid that happening are incredibly high. In fact, it's one of the things I I've done some research on this. I kind of show is that the single biggest thing you can do to protect your child who's not very smart from being downwardly mobile is get them a four-year college degree. So if you if you control for someone's cognitive ability in adolescence, and then you look at the ones who still you know who start at the top, how do they stay at the top? It turns out that four-year college degree is the most effective way to prevent against downward mobility because by the time employers find out this person's not that smart, it'll be too late. They're already on a professional track, so they'll be okay. And so my the sort of jokey version of that I say to people is if you've got two kids, one of them's smart, one of them's less smart than the other, and you can only afford to send one of them to college, send the less smart one. The smart one will be fine on their own, but the less mm. smart one needs that four-year college degree as a credential to survive uh, the labor market. And meanwhile, there's lots of kids who are plenty smart who we don't get to four-year college because of all the Mm. barriers we put in their place. And there's probably as as many kids who shouldn't be in college from rich families as there are kids who should be in college who aren't from poor families. We just need to swap them out. But of course, saying to an upper middle class American that their kid shouldn't get a four-year college degree is like, I mean, it's like how to silence a dinner table. I mean, you might as well, you know, break wind, honestly. Um, Yeah. yeah. Uh, And when people say college isn't for everyone, you can be certain they don't mean their children. Mm. Um, What they mean is those other children. So anyway, it's a long wind up, but it's kind of even longer answer that um, the, the desire to want the best for your children is a noble one and should be encouraged and supported in, you know, hugely. But does it go all the way? Is there a limit to that value against other values? And I think there is. There is, um, And I think that there's, that's true morally, right? Just because you could do something to give your kids a slightly greater advantage doesn't mean you should if it's not the morally right thing to do. It's just, it's just no, it's not, right? And I'll give you another example, right? I think I've been public with this. So I can say that is Tony Blair's wife called me and asked if I would give an internship at the think tank I ran for one of her kids. And I said, no. Well, actually, what I said was they can apply like everybody else. I'm not going to give a give an internship to someone just because they happen to be the son or daughter of a prime minister. Right. Also my, of course, my trustees are like, mm, that's not a very good decision. We, look, we, we've gone and talk out both sides of our mouth here, right? So you've got to trust. Also, the other thing is at some point, your kids have got to feel like they've done it, at least to some extent, on their own, right? And I think that is the kind of hyper-parenting problem. That is, I do think that in the long run, it's probably even better for the kids themselves to feel like they've made it their own. So the, the kid I didn't get an internship for, he, got, he found an internship for himself, right? And he knew he'd done it for himself. He didn't get it because dad sorted it out for him. He got it himself. And I think that actually that's a very different kind of success. Even if, let's say, he didn't, get, you know, he only made it to the 95th percentile of whatever distribution rather than 98th percentile. My God, I'd much rather he knew he got to the 95th on his own or the 50th on his own, frankly, than the 99th because of mom and dad. In the sports world here, and when they talk about prospects, they use the terminology floor and ceiling. So at the floor, there'll be a serviceable Major League Baseball player and they'll do well. On the ceiling, they could be, you know, they could grow up to be, you know, uh, they have the potential to be just below Mike Trout or something, right? And this notion of floor and ceiling, giving you a way in which to sort of think about your own child's chances is interesting. And your description of the middle class as a potential unattractive floor, to me, is sort of compelling. I mean, personally, when I think about choices I've made and when I've pushed advantages for my kids. I mean, the most obvious one is that when I moved from New York to the town I live in now, just north of the city, I did so for the schools. Mm. Same. And I noticed that the schools, I'm like, wow, 90% of the kids or 95% of the kids who go to these schools go to college. Now, it could be part of the schools, it could be the community, it could be the expectations, whatever it is. And there was a part of me that was like, I think I've done my job. Which is not to say that I'm not doing more to support my kids and make sure they learn and do well in school, but if you live in this town and you can't do well, then, you know, there's something, there's some, there's an issue there, right? Right. It's on you. It's on you at that point, I think. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, versus, you know, I do know people who in the same town make different decisions, right? And I know them to be kind and wonderful people, but they just, you know, they're making different decisions to continue to do more and they have the means to do so. And so, and having these conversations are always 
not easy and challenging. You're probably going to remember the names and I'm going to be embarrassed because I'm going to forget. But there was the work of the two, um, two sociologists who, were, who did the, um, the doll study. You know what I'm referring to? I think it was the Clarks, a, a husband and wife team. And they did the, the study where basically they were trying to understand children's preferences according to race. And so part of the exercise was to try to see whether children would prefer a white doll or a black doll. Mm-hmm. And what they had learned was that the white girls preferred the white doll. But surprisingly, the black girls also preferred the white doll. And what was interesting is I learned that that couple had made a similar move than as I did out of, you know, I think almost the same neighborhood in New York to the same town north of the city. And when they were asked why they didn't sort of stay in the neighborhood, which was largely African-American, where the schools maybe weren't as good, their response was, I have ideals, but I only, my, but my child only has one life to live. And so you saw this sort of real tension. And again, I think some of that may be predicated upon where you come from. Like if you came from little, you may be more inclined if you make it and you do well to sort of really make sure your kids don't fall down because you remember what it was like to have less. Um, or you may have different sort of views of people um, at different classes. But I think there is also, what you were alluding to, is the reality is, is that middle class today is not what middle class was a generation ago. Well, that's the fear. That yeah. The, and this is true. I mean, it's true empirically, right? The, the gap, the, it's a longer way to fall in an unequal society. And as other work I've done with my colleague, Bell Sawhill, and others show is that life is, has gotten progressively, relatively speaking, tougher in the middle, right? So the sense of how, how comfortable can you be with the thought that your kid's are going to be downwardly mobile, right? Let's assume that we're starting in the top 10%. How do we feel about our kids ending up in the middle? It's partly dependent on how the middle looks. And right now, it doesn't look so great. And so to some extent, it's rational to be concerned about that downward mobility, which is why it's it, we should all want a society in which the stakes are somewhat lower. I think lowering the stakes of economic or a- academic failure or success is a big part of the challenge here because it could lower the temperature. The other problem, though, however, is that as we become more segregated by neighborhood and institution and so on, our relative benchmarks for what counts as success move too rapidly. And so what happens is you can end up in a neighborhood where actually only going to the local state flagship university is kind of a failure, right? Because all their friends are going to, so suddenly it's got to be Ivy League or kind of one of these other, right? And you're like, seriously? Uh, and But the reason for that is because if they're surrounded by people who are all heading to the Ivy League, then by comparison, going to the University of Maryland College Park or wherever the equivalent is for you kind of is a failure, right? So, but, but, but I spend half my time saying to people that we're basically, to look at the distinctions that a lot of successful Americans are interested in academically, particularly, but economically, you need a microscope. Right, you need you, you need to go to right to the top of the distribution, and then you need to kind of just really zoom in and go. Oh, yeah, there is a very slight difference between the University of Maryland and Georgetown. I mean, it's so slight that you do need to really squint through a microscope to see it. But if everybody you know is making the choices between that, to use your language of the floor, if the floor is a state for a good state for you right? Then of course the ceiling is going to be kind of, meanwhile, the modal destination for kids from the bottom 80% of the distribution of the US by income is community college, right? I've you mentioned community college, but that's where American kids go. But you wouldn't think that from the conversations that are taking place among the upper middle class. That's where the inequality point, I think, really does kind of come into play. But it's also just this sense of like, at what point, it, what, what's enough parenting, right? What's enough? When's, when is enough? Because you can always do more, right? But at some point you say, yeah, I've done, I think I like the way you think about it. I've kind of done my job here, but I'll go to the, I will be honest about this. I think there's extremes the other way. I gave this talk and I was honest about my own position. My kids would go, you know, for me, public school, partly because I just think if you get them in a good public school, you're just throwing money away to send them to a private K-12. But that's an economic calculation, not a moral one as much as anything. But honestly, the, the evidence for me is just not strong enough to justify the price these people are paying. Uh, but but so I was honest about where my trade-offs. And this woman said to me, she said, well, you're not going anywhere that far enough. You're a hypocrite. You say all this, but you're using your money to select into a good school just the same way that other people are. And she said, I have the money to send my kids to a private school or live somewhere good. I have deliberately chosen to live next to the worst high school in Washington, D.C. and send my daughter there. And I think that's what you should do. 
And I think I see that as an, that's, that's equitable. That's the right thing. If you really believe what you say. And for me, that's just goes way too far the other way, because I think what that's doing is saying, it's not just, I'm going to try and avoid hoarding opportunity. You're actually using your child as an instrument of social policy. And I do not think that using your, seeing your child as a, a social policy instrument is the right thing to do as a parent, right? I, I, I looked at when I said, well, I admire you. I think it's great. And also, because you said, because unless people like me send my kids to schools like that, those schools won't improve. So my daughter and my daughter might do much worse maybe at that school. But honestly, unless you're willing to make a cut. So then I thought, well, okay, now you know, I'm getting attacked from both sides now. <laughs> so I must be, I'm either getting it really wrong or maybe a little bit right. What's sad about that story is that, that we have to acknowledge that there are schools that are just underperforming, right? That, that the idea of a public education, which was supposed to be a floor and that floor was supposed to be solid, is not equitable community to community, school to school. You know, your most recent work with, with Bell is around sort of the, the future of the middle class, right? And to me, what was interesting about that is that sometimes we would, it would have been very logical to have grouped that work around things like schools or education or certain programs or government benefits. And obviously there's recommendations that are sort of included in, in that work. But the fact that you had divided according, you know, sort of defining sort of tenets of middle class as as money and time and relationships and health and respect, the kinds of things that we would all nod our heads and say, yeah, we should all have enough money for our family and time to spend with them and good relationships with our neighbors and our, and people we, 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 we know and love and, and be in good health and have respect. I mean, universal sort of truths, but that's not often how we design policy, right? Starting from those kinds of values. And it ends up sometimes feeling more patchwork than it should, you know, like a, a constant game of whack-a-mole mm-hmm. to fix different problems with our, with our society. So I'm wondering as you were developing that project, which I understand in, involved not just sort of you know, stepping back and thinking, what do we need to do, but talking to people and and getting a sense of what they needed. How did you come to think about reestablishing to, to use the metaphor using earlier, that floor with these kinds of, you know, ingredients? Hmm. It's a great question. And thank you for reading the work so carefully. I really, really do appreciate that. And you're right. We drew heavily on qualitative research as well. So focus groups and a series of individual interviews. But I I think because the way we start the question we started with is what makes for a good quality of life and how is the American middle class doing on those dimensions rather than presuming that this is just all about money or all about education or whatever and to recognize that it's multi-dimensional right a good life is a multi-dimensional thing it's plural plus we have different views about what constitutes a good life right or how much of something we need so we try to identify these kind of core ingredients which you just mentioned and then to try and see how the middle class is doing on those dimensions and the answer is not as well as we think it ought to be which is of course a judgment how do you wait what's how do you decide what's good enough but I mean, a couple of you know base economic facts are that gr- income growth in the middle 60% has been half as fast as it has at the top and actually at the bottom if you include the value of benefits, welfare benefits and safety net programs like healthcare to the bottom. So the safety net sort of helped, has kind of worked. Not, I'm not suggesting it's adequate. And meanwhile, those, are, those of us at the top, um, we've had, you know, growing earnings and by and large we've managed to share those earnings with another earner um through marriage and through house you know household formation so the top 20 percent are doing just great thank you very much and the bottom 20 percent have at least been somewhat helped by the safety net but the middle 60 have seen income growth about half as fast over the last few decades so you do see that problem and i don't want to overstate it's not like there's been no growth in income but there hasn't been as much as as we wanted but we didn't just want to make it about money because it seems to us as if when you actually ask people what matters and this is i think m- much more in your court in some ways than ours but what what does it mean to succeed right? what does it mean to have a good life it's not just money and actually it's rather arrogant for those of us who have money to presume that it is it's equally naive to suggest that you don't need it but put it in balance it's like what are the trade-offs that people face between say time with family and money you need to earn money do they have the space and time to build strong relationships with each other? 
and how is the health, right? How do you feel mental health as much as anything else? Hugely important to quality of life. Last but not least, respect. How are you treated? How are you talked about? And how do you feel about yourself? And so that was an attempt to sort of delineate, if you like, the kind of core ingredients of well-being. And the middle, having a good, having a kind of good quality of life in the middle is important just because there's a lot of people for whom that counts. But for two other reasons. One, you want to have a middle class that people aspire to join, right? It's part of the engine of upward mobility. You want people, so this is not the floor. This is the, you know, for people who are, who are particularly recent immigrants, so like, yeah, I want that. I want to live like that, right? So you, it's, it has this, you know, you, got, you want people to look up at the American middle class from around the world and go, yeah, I want that. Very powerful engine of upward mobility. On the other hand, you also want it to be one that people like us, I shouldn't speak for you, but, but people like me from the upper middle class don't freak out at the idea that our kids might end up there because by definition, some people are going to be downwardly mobile and that's going to include some of our kids. And so it's got to feel like a safe enough place for people to be downwardly mobile into and an attractive enough place for people to be upwardly mobile into. And right now we don't think it's passing either of those tests. Part of the challenge in these kinds of conversations is that is that there's always this sort of social comparison. You're looking below, you're looking above, you're, you know, there's fear or opportunity depending upon what you think your, you know, current sort of station in life is. And I note that even in the description of your work, the issues that you care about, there is work on inequality as and labeled as such and work um, on the middle class and described as such and mobility. And I don't know if you'd read the book um, on inequality by Harry Frankfurt, but he makes a, a really compelling case that we spend too much time talking about inequality and the differences and not enough time talking about sufficiency and what do we need. And I wonder, as your work has evolved over the course of time, and again, you're most, you've gone from hoarding, you know, not to so that you don't think about it or talk about it, uh, but now you're sort of like, this is what we think you know, the middle class needs and we need to support this for various reasons. Where do you see the opportunity for like nationally to have a better conversation and to sort of get behind the kinds of things that we would all agree with or aspire to and perhaps trying to stop the, the class divide conversation in a way that sometimes, while maybe helpful to sort of make sure that we're aware of the lives of others, maybe not as conducive to advancing policy. I guess at the, the risk of sounding like a cop-out, I think part of the challenge here is to sort of be thinking multiple things at once and recognizing that there are there's a plurality of goods at stake here. And, and so one argument might be that inequality in and of itself doesn't matter. It's just, you know, if you have a society where everyone has a sufficiency, then who cares, right? So a great example of that might be that actually like take some of like the Scandinavian countries, there's quite a lot of inequality right at the top and actually a real lack of mobility right at the very top, right? So they're actually quite unequal at the very top, but they're pretty equal for the rest of the side. So, so in other words, like take something like Sweden, Sweden's very egalitarian for the bottom 99%, the 98%. This just has a very, very, it has a, a self-perpetuating elite right at the top. So I said, well, who cares? Right, it's fine. Um, even if a Gini coefficient or some measure of inequality isn't as great as it should be, it doesn't matter because you know, everyone's got what they need. And that's one. That's a perfectly reasonable way to think about it. And actually, I think if people do feel that, they should be clear about it. There's another view that inequality is just bad in and of itself at a certain level, that it's just morally wrong for some people to have more uh, at a certain level than others, even in a society that is quite well off. It's quite rich, right? So even if the American middle class is incredibly rich by historical and global standards, what counts is how are they doing compared to the rest of society and particularly those at the top. And you get someone like Gabriel Zuckman who works with Piketty and Saez and so on who recently said something like something to the effect of um, if you could take money off rich people and drop it in the ocean, would you? And he basically said yes. And I thought that was a very morally clarifying answer because what he's saying is inequality is just intrinsically bad. And so even if I'm not taking money off rich people to, to do something else with it, I'm still going to take it off them. Mm. And that's very clarifying because it's like, no, it's inequality per se is the problem. And I like it when people are clear about that. And the other thing that's happening here, I think, is that there are tensions. This is part of my own work between the hoarding and uh, middle class sufficiency. Let's use that Frank, the Frankfurt term you used. I think they're related but not the same thing because in hoarding, I'm much more interested in kind of relative position and relative mobility and this kind of sense of like, just because I'm at the top doesn't mean my kids should inherit my position at the top. 
Whereas the sufficiency question, or, or to some extent, the inequality question is like, how are people doing, right? It's, it's an absolute mobility question, which is just everybody's getting better off. And so what if we don't change places? And the and thing is that both of those things matter. So one way to think about this is my earlier work on hoarding was much more about relative position and how we do need kind of movement up and down the ladder between the generations. We don't want intergenerational stickiness or too much. Whereas the middle class work really is more about absolute mobility. It's more just about the fact that just people aren't going to kind of getting you know, the middle class. So, so the person at the 50th percentile today, right in the middle of the distribution, isn't as well off as they should be compared to their parent who is also at the 50th percentile. So even if there's no movement, there's zero relative mobility. So person in the middle, kids of person in the middle become person in middle, right? I still care how the person in the middle is doing and that middle is just not rising fast enough. It, there's no one good <laughs> that is more important than the others. Um, and, but I think it's helpful to be clear which one you're talking about at any particular moment in time. And most importantly, you mentioned policy. Which problem is this policy supposed to address? Because sometimes it's not clear whether this is an anti-inequality pol- policy or a sufficiency policy, to use it, or a intergenerational mobility policy, or a just take money off the rich because we don't like them being rich policy. And, and so and those are all perfectly legitimate goals, but it's really clear. It has, it's important to be really clear what the goal is. From what I read, I believe you, you came up in a, a middle-class home, right? And I'm wondering how your own family, both in the UK and, um, and here in America, like how do they see and internalize your work? You told the story about your, your, your son in the internship, but I'm just wondering how, when the rubber meets the road and they're reflecting are people who may have known you as a child who know who you are now and what you're sort of advocate, like, how does that all around those dinner tables, when we were able to sort of congregate as such, (laughs) how do those conversations go? Well, it's very interesting to, uh, I mean, one thing I will say is that I had this very interesting exchange with my mum where I'd mentioned the fact that she made us do ballroom dancing lessons, learn how to waltz and all that in this kind of working class town because she thought that was important for upward mobility. And then when I, she read that, she said, no, I, no I, I didn't do that. I was like, yeah, you did. So I had to get the certificates out to prove it to her. And she's <laughs> like, she'd, she'd forgotten that bit. But I said, because my parents were both very upwardly mobile um, themselves, both from my father especially actually, but from, you know, um, modest backgrounds to say the least and had done re- pretty well the, that gave us a much more secure footing plus a very stable marriage um, and you know, lots of uh, security and stability in our childhoods which made a huge difference to us I think that I, I inherited from them the kind of sense of good enough parenting I think which is we're going to do our bit but never this sort of strenuous sense of like ambition so i applied to oxford from my school i think i was only the second or third person from my school to go to either oxford or cambridge and my parents were like great they were thrilled that i was applying but they didn't suggest it or particularly care you know and they were delighted when i got but there was no sense of pressure right it was no and i think and that felt good interestingly a lot of my my friends who kind of come from you know more modest backgrounds who I was at school with, including some very close kind of high school friends, actually they're probably more American in that kind of meritocratic sense. They're more in a kind of sense of like, I really did make it myself. And some of them have done really very, very well. And again, I think those are the people who it's kind of harder to have this conversation with, right? And when you cross cut it with race, especially. And I do think there's something to the fact that, you know, it takes, it takes time to make class. And it, I think that that sense of class stickiness and hereditary privilege probably doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one generation. And so it's tougher to say to someone that really has done a Horatio Alger rags to riches thing, you shouldn't do everything for your kids, as it is someone who's second or third generation well off enough. Um, but around you know the old the dinner tables of the pre-COVID era, Sure, it was very it was very interesting to to see the difference between the liberal responses in the US um, and and the UK. Um, but I do you know I look my mentioned to you before we started recording. My brother's a doctor. Uh, I'm a professional. You know my my um, parents have been very fortunate in the sense that they provided a stable platform from which we could launch. But they didn't launch us. They saw they saw their job as to be the kind of aircraft carrier from which we would launch, we would fly off, um, never to be behind the controls. And I've tried to stick to that kind of philosophy um, with my own kids, even when it's been difficult to do so. It's a lovely metaphor. I end each show with, uh, with the same sort of uh, question, which is, you know, typically you'll go through the credits and say who edited the show or who the music is by, but I often prefer to defer to the guest 
to use as an opportunity to do your own credits. Like who do you credit for where you are today or who would you like to take this time to thank? It doesn't need to be exhaustive. Um, so no pressure if you leave someone off, but it's just always nice to give um, an opportunity for someone to just acknowledge others who have attributed to where they are. And I love that idea, by the way. I love the fact that you do that. So Michael Taylor, who was the headmaster of my high school, who uh, definitely put me on a different trajectory in terms of where he thought I could go and change the way I viewed myself and going going forward. There's no question that was different. But uh, my, my parents for creating a model of marriage that's been very difficult to live up to, but at the same time, a, a foundation of kind of unconditional love and and support that is something that I, if I can get even close to it in the way I raised my own children, I shall be incredibly happy because that sense of a, a the, the 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 carrier from which they launched us was is was and is full of kind of love and support um, going forward. And you know my my siblings actually um, uh, my sister who unfortunately died of cancer, but um, uh, and my older brother who's uh, now a COVID doctor in the UK. Uh, they they just have been an extraordinary resource just to have siblings who are friends and allies I think is one of the greatest gifts you can have and so I've been kind of hugely grateful to them for getting where I am where I am today well thank you uh, so much for being generous in your time and your and your thinking and uh, for all the work that you do to contribute to uh, trying to get us to sort of think about where we are in our own lives and how to support those who maybe aren't in similar situations and to do so with a sense of, of, of humility and challenging us to really ask us to, you know, walk the walk. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. Learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone special, make their day and let them know.